Hello everyone! Today's video is entitled Electronegativity. Electronegativity is a periodic trend. It relates to the ability of an atom to attract electrons during bonding. This concept is fundamental to the understanding of how atoms form bonds, and the properties later exhibited by the compounds they create. It's important to say that without a full appreciation of electronegativity, it may be nearly impossible to grasp future concepts in chemistry. So let's get started. As I mentioned, the electronegativity of an atom, symbolized by the capital letters EN, is a measure of the atom's ability to attract electrons within a chemical bond. When two atoms form a bond, each atom in the bond attracts the other atom's electrons in addition to its own. For this reason, electronegativity is considered the defining periodic property of atoms that are involved in chemical bonds. There are two general trends for electronegativity. As you go across a period, electronegativity increases. That is, as you go across the period from left to right, the ability of an atom to attract electrons increases. Now this of course makes sense when you consider the fact that there is an increase in the number of protons within each atom as you move from left to right on the periodic table, despite having the same number of energy levels. This increase in, pro in proton force or positive force increases the atom's ability to attract electrons towards the nucleus. It's worth noting that this trend of electronegativity is the reverse of the trend for atomic size, but is caused by the very same reason. As you move across a period, the size of the atom decreases. This is also caused by an increase in the number of protons within each atom and an unchanged amount of electron shielding. And so, of course, that's the key, right? By keeping the amount of electron shielding constant while increasing the positive force, the atom decreases in size but increases in its ability to attract electrons within a bond. And that is what electronegativity is. And so, if an atom has a higher electronegativity, it will attract the bonding pair of electrons within a chemical bond more strongly because the bonding pair will be pulled closer towards its nucleus. Now, as you go down a group on the periodic table, the electronegativity decreases due to an increase in electron shielding. The ability of a nucleus to attract valence electrons decreases as a result of an increase in the number of inner energy levels. The electrons in those inner energy levels contribute to the repulsion that pushes valence electrons outward and counteracts a nucleus's attempt to draw them in. In a compound, increasing energy levels between valence electrons and the nucleus means that the nucleus attracts bonding pairs less strongly. The image on the bottom left draws attention again to the relationship between electronegativity and atomic size. You can clearly see that as the atomic size increases, electronegativity decreases and vice versa. This graph shows that fluorine with the highest amount of electronegativity actually has the smallest atomic size. So how does electronegativity specifically impact bonding? So before we get into that, let's go over some basics um, of ionic and covalent bonding. As we know, ionic compounds are compounds that are comprised of nonmetals and metals that we believe transfer an electron, whereas covalent compounds contain atoms that share electrons. What people may not realize is that all bonds actually share electrons. However, the sharing can either be equal, unequal, or extremely unequal. Which brings us to the concept of polarity. Polarity is just a means of explaining what we call polar covalent bonds, which are bonds that exist when electrons between atoms are slightly to moderately unequally shared. 
Let's jump to the next slide to understand exactly what that means. The three images you see here are of electron clouds of three different types of bonds. The first cloud is of a nonpolar covalent bond, the second, a polar covalent bond, and the third, an ionic bond. But what does it mean to say that a bond is polar? Well, the word pole is derived from Latin to mean end. Just as we have two opposite ends to Earth, the North Pole and the South Pole, a compound can also have two opposite ends. One end of a compound can be slightly positive, and one end slightly negative. The slightly positive end would be referred to as the positive pole, and the slightly negative, the negative pole. If a compound has two slightly charged ends, it's referred to as polar. But then, how does a compound become polar? Well, if you take a closer look at the electron clouds of the differing types of bonds, you'll begin to understand how this happens. The dark spots in the center of these clouds are the nuclei of two atoms involved in bonding. For the nonpolar covalent compound, you'll notice that the nuclei of the two atoms are very close in size, if not exactly the same size. It is for this reason that the electron cloud that is between these two atoms is evenly distributed around the two nuclei. But for the polar covalent compound, the two nuclei are not the same size. One is slightly larger than the other, meaning one has more protons within it than the other. This causes an unequal sharing of the electron cloud between the two atoms. The atom with the larger nucleus will have much more of the electron cloud around it. And this is because it has more positive force due to having more protons. The clustering of electrons on one side of the molecule creates a slightly negative charge on this compound. Because the electrons are being pulled to one side of the molecule, the opposite side is left with a slightly positive charge. Now, the slightly positive charge occurs because as the electrons are being pulled to the opposite end, you're exposing the positive nucleus of this smaller atom, leaving a slightly positive charge. Now, of course, the positive side would be called again the positive pole, and the negative side would be called the negative pole. For the ionic compound, you'll notice that one of the nuclei is much larger than the other. And so the electron cloud is pulled far to one side. It is for this reason that the electrons are considered to be extremely unequally shared between these two atoms. So many people refer to this extreme unequal sharing as a transfer of electrons rather than a sharing of electrons between the two atoms. Now, it is important to note that it would be very wrong to write um, positive and negative signs on a polar compound because it is not ionic. The reason being, polar compounds do not have full positive and negative charges. Only ionic compounds do. So how do we symbolize partial charges? Well, scientists symbolize partial charges with the use of the Greek letter delta. That is this odd looking D right there. To identify partial negative or partial positive charges on a polar covalent compound, you do so by writing the delta sign before the positive or negative sign on either side of the molecule. And this is what differentiates the polar compounds from ionic compounds. So that would look something like this. By writing in the delta sign, we've now completely differentiated these charges from the full positive and negative charges that would then be applied to an ionic compound. And so, the differences between electronegativities can be used to decide whether a bond between two atoms is either nonpolar, polar, or ionic. Let me walk you through an analogy that may help solidify this concept. Think of a bond between two atoms as a tug of war. If the atoms were the exact same strength, neither one would win the electrons. And so the electrons would stay evenly distributed 
among those two atoms. And so that looks like the nonpolar covalent compound here. But if one atom is slightly stronger than the other, the electrons will be pulled closer to one side, and that results in a polar covalent compound. The third possibility is if one of the atoms is Arnold Schwarzenegger. In this situation, the electrons are pulled so far to one side that the compound then generates a full negative charge and a full positive charge. And so the full negative would be here and the full positive would be there. And this is what we refer to as ionic. And of course, in this analogy, strength is positive pull from the nucleus. Let's apply this analogy to water. The compound you see at the bottom here is water. Now, as I mentioned earlier, based on their position on the periodic table, we know that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Simply put, oxygen has a larger nucleus with more protons than hydrogen does, and so it will attract electrons more within a bond. If we apply the tug-of-war analogy, a bond between oxygen and hydrogen would look something like this, where oxygen would be the slightly negative side of the molecule, and hydrogen would be the slightly positive. When applied to the water molecule, the symbols would look like this. As you can see, the unequal sharing of electrons within this compound have created two opposite ends, a negative pole and a positive pole. Because this compound has two different poles, scientists refer to them as dipoles. The Greek prefix di is used to indicate that there are two poles. And so, a polar covalent compound has two slightly charged ends called dipoles. So the real question is how do we know if the atoms in a particular bond are going to create a nonpolar covalent compound, a polar covalent compound, or an ionic compound? Well, the only way to determine this is by calculating the difference in electronegativity of the two atoms involved in the bond. The electronegativity values are located on the periodic table. Here you can see that each element on the periodic table has a very specific electronegativity value. By taking the electronegativity value of each atom involved in a bond and subtracting them from one another, you will get the difference in electronegativity. In the coming slides, I will show you how to use the difference in electronegativity to determine if a particular bond will be nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. So where are the electronegativity values? Let's zoom in to take a better look. The electronegativity value for each element is located directly underneath its atomic number. And so for hydrogen, the electronegativity value is 2.1. For magnesium, 1.2. For titanium, 1.5, and so on and so forth. These are the numbers you will use to calculate electronegativity difference and determine if a particular bond is nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. The symbol delta En, and yes, I'm saying delta again, but this time I'm referring to the capitalized version of the Greek letter delta, which is written as this triangular shape you see here, represents the difference between electronegativity values. And so we use delta En to signify the difference in electronegativity. The difference in the electronegativities of two atoms in a bond tells us if the bond that is forming will either be a nonpolar covalent bond, a polar covalent bond, or an ionic bond. If the differences between the electronegativity values of two atoms lands within the range of 0 and 0 0.4, then the bond that is formed will be a nonpolar covalent bond. However, if the differences in the electronegativity values of two atoms lands between 0 0.5 and 1.6, then the bond that is formed between those two atoms will be polar covalent. And of course, if the difference in electronegativities lands between 1.7 and 3.3, then the bond that is formed between those two atoms will be ionic. Please note that a difference of 0 0.5 actually belongs to the polar range. It does not belong to the nonpolar range. And a difference of 1.7 belongs to the ionic range. It does not belong to the polar range. 
And so that's why the ranges are from 0 to 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 to 1.6. And of course, when calculating the electronegativity difference, the smaller electronegativity value must always be subtracted from the larger electronegativity value. This needs to be done so that the electronegativity difference is always positive. Okay, so let's jump to some practice questions. But before we do these questions together, I do strongly recommend that you pause the video and you grab your periodic table so you can refer to the values or for electronegativity um, as we do these questions together. Okay, so the first question, 1A, is a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. And so is this bond going to be ionic or polar covalent or non-polar covalent? So we look up the electronegativity values from the periodic table, and I find that oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference will give me 1.4. And that lands this bond firmly within the polar range. And so this is a polar bond. The next one carbon and hydrogen. So carbon is 2.5, hydrogen again is 2.1. When you find the difference, you see that it's 0 0.4, which lands it in the nonpolar covalent range. Magnesium and chlorine. So chlorine is 3.0 and magnesium is 1.2. The difference is 1.8 and that lands it firmly in the ionic range. And so, of course, this makes sense based off of previous teachings because it's a metal and a non-metal and that should form an ionic compound. Boron and fluorine. So fluorine is actually 4.0. That's the highest electronegativity value you can have on the periodic table. And boron is 2.0. Um, it gives you a difference of two and that again lands you firmly in the ionic range. And so now we have chromium and oxygen. The difference will be 1.9, again, ionic. Carbon and nitrogen, uh, which is gonna give you 0 0.5. And again, this is one that tricks a lot of students. Like I said before, 0 0.5 actually lands it in the polar range. And so that's gonna be polar. Now we have sodium and iodine that gives us 1.6. That's gonna land it in the polar range as well and sodium and bromine that gives us 1.9 and that gives us the ionic range okay now what confuses a lot of students is um, sodium and iodine now sodium is a metal and iodine is a non-metal and yet it gives us 1.6 a polar uh, bond and so that can happen uh, these examples are the reasons why electronegativity is so important uh, it tells us why atoms are forming the bonds that they are and the compounds having very different types of properties we would expect those compounds to have because of the type of metals that are forming them. And so brings us to aluminum and chlorine. Again, aluminum and chlorine is going to form a difference of 1.5, which lands it in the polar range. And so it is a polar covalent compound, not an ionic compound. Again, very important examples to remember. Uh, and sometimes can be very tricky for students uh, because they expect that these compounds should be ionic uh, and they miss it because they don't do the calculation for electronegativity to find that in fact they're polar covalent compounds. Okay, uh, so with the conclusion of this slide, uh, we have reached the end of this lecture. Okay, thank you for listening.